Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion, um, virtual and media production. And our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the Kilo Show. The Kilo Show, 1,000 shows without taking a break. Is to hold our breath. Um, any, so we're going to be doing that, talking about that uh, in the second hour. So if you've got questions or comments or ideas, go ahead and throw those into the second hour. And uh, now we're going to go ahead and jump into the questions. Mitch, what do we have? And first question in for Mike Muddy Schlegel in Raleigh, North Carolina, asking, what are your favorite mobile power options to power a laptop? Alex, do you have a car charger powerful enough for a laptop? And are there battery options as well? Uh, go ahead, Bill. Well, I just had one thought on one part of it. The newest Anchor large bricks that uh, have a USB-C port do have enough power to go charge one of the newer MacBook Pros. So if you're using that configuration um, and you buy one of the large, I think they're 1,800 uh, milli or 18,000 milliamps or better, those batteries will keep your laptop going for a longer period of time. Yeah, I I um I know I have one that that is I mean tangentially able to do it. I just I'm, I'm trying to find it. I it's in my car, so I was just trying to find the the um uh, the actual one. A, a lot of the things that I've done in the past are AC inverters, and so in the car, in general, I almost always have a car with an AC inverter in it. So the AC inverter just takes the it takes the out of the what do they call it now, the accessory port <laughs> as opposed to the cigarette lighter. Um, it takes that power out and pushes it into a, you know, a, a standard um, three, you know, Edison three pin. And so, so that, that's what I've used the most. You do have to be careful because you can't pull a lot out of the car and you do have to make sure the car's running or it will run out of battery because you're moving from its battery to your battery. Um, but those are things to kind of take into account. Um, uh, I've definitely owned a lot of different <clears throat> a lot of different batteries and, and um, you, you know, a lot of these will, will work. You, you're looking for a larger one, um, you know, to make that work. But, but I, I can't, I don't know if there's any, uh, hyper juice is probably the one that I've used the most as far as um, something that keeps it work, you know, a, a battery that I keep in my, in my bag. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, yeah, I've used these uh, for our portable prompters. Sometimes we use these, uh, I went halfway there. Uh, these uh, BMK 200 watt car power inverters, like you were talking about, it plugs into your car, and it has a feed. It has a feed through on the uh, on the uh, DC jack there, so you can see that it, you don't give up that uh, connection in your car. Plus, it has a voltmeter on it, and it has uh, four or five USB uh, power outlets on it, uh, USB type a power outlets on it. So it's handy to have for plugging your phone in other accessories in, and, uh, it's only about $22. Very good. A black Friday, say, <laughs> uh, uh, next question from Kenny Hampton in Greenville, Illinois, looking for a wiring diagram software to illustrate and instruct connections for a small portable studio. If possible, easy to master Mac or cloud-based preferred any suggestions. Javier. Uh, the one I like a lot is H2R Gear, the website h2rgear.com, because it is extremely simple to, to master and it is cloud based. Uh, you add your, you, you don't have to add your manually. You can like search for different, like an ATEM or a different camera and it uh, imports it with all the ins and outs. So you can wire the diagrams. I really, really like it because the cables are uh, color coded by XLR plug or whatever kind of, uh, of cable. There is a, a free version. So you you can test it without any uh, compromise and there is like a five a month for basic and then like a 15 dollars a month that gives you like a, you can export a patch bay like uh, this input with this cable goes to this output so it's like very very simple oh, Jonas? that's exactly what i wanted to say it's a really a great solution and this is the patch bay that i'm just showing it's uh, really great to keep uh, an overview of which cable goes into where hey, good bill as a purpose-built tool, I don't think that can be beat. If you want a generic tool that does a good job, uh, I use OmniGraffle, which is a nice little um, general purpose tool that allows you to create diagrams, wiring diagrams, and other kinds, and does a whole lot more stuff. But I think that one's the key if you're just looking to do this job and nothing else. Good, Mark. Uh, second for OmniGraffle, we'll take that and we'll lay it out over an AutoCAD drawing of whatever set we're going to build. Yeah, the... Um, uh those are the two h2r graphics is, is incredible and omni as a general purpose um, kind of diagram tool 
is what a lot of us on the Mac use. I've been using it since version one. <laughs> so, so I, and I use it for a lot of different things. It's not just that I do wiring diagrams with it. I, I do all kinds of diagrams uh, using it. So it's, it's pretty useful. Um, next question. From Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, PA. Josh asks, what are some low friction methods of collecting payment from clients? Preferably services with low transaction fees. Are there any services to be cautious about? I go ahead, Mitchell. Louis and Rocco. Never had a problem. Okay, good, Jonas. I found that it's a big issue in the U.S., but in Europe and the rest of the world, we just use a SEPA transfer and it works all the time. Good, John. I've used uh, in the past FreshBooks and then PayPal services. Uh, keep in mind, anything that's going to charge you a flat rate is going to be higher than just establishing something with your own credit card vendor. Um, I've been kind of developing your own payment portal. Yeah, I would say that, um, I mean, for, for most of the jobs that I do, uh, Swift <laughs> is the way we, we mostly do it. I mean, it's it's just bank to bank transfer, as opposed to trying to um, do it, but it depends on the size, because it can that two and a half percent or whatever percent that you're getting charged. Uh, you know, if, if it's a big job, it can add up to a lot of money. Uh, go ahead, John. Take Bitcoin and sell it immediately. The lowest transaction fees of any other transactional phase system. <laughs> Very good. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, we use Square for credit card uh, uh, payments in the field. That that works pretty well, and they deposit directly into our account, but they do take a fee. Right, yeah. And and for, for fees that are, I would say, sub $10,000, it's not as bad. It's when it starts going over that that things start to become, um, you know, get, it starts to add up, and then you have to decide who's going to pay for that, and usually it's going to be you. Because <laughs> the client, if you, if you give a client a quote, and then you come back and say it's 2.5% more or 5% more, they're going to be like, what? You know, so uh, so that's unless they ask for using the credit card. Uh, next question. Richard Bowman in Defiance, Ohio, asks, is this the future of prosumer cameras? And there's a link there to a, a viewfinder that goes on your smartphone. Uh, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, this kind of solves that image problem people have been talking about on the panel for a while about uh, you walk in and want to shoot with your um, your phone and people look at you funny. And if you put it on a gimbal, they start to think, oh, okay, that's more professional. But when you have a viewfinder, then they don't even notice the phone. I thought this little Kickstarter program is kind of cute, but then I looked deeper into it and it actually looks pretty interesting. Uh, they've got diopters to be able to adjust for what you see versus what they expect you to see. And it's got an opening at the bottom so that if there are any adjustments you make with say, um, I don't know, special camera software you're using, you can still access those for reaching inside the viewfinder to, to get it. They're pricing a uh, Kickstarter at $299 US. Uh, they expect retail at $499 US. Good. I think that's a little high for plastic, but it, it does have a handle on it, which makes it more like a handy cam. And that, that I think, could be pretty popular. Go ahead, Courtney. One of the biggest problems shooting on a phone, if you're just shooting for later editing, is storage because you're going to run out of storage. And a lot of phones that don't have micro SD cards built into them, like the Apple series does, doesn't have. So have, they haven't solved that problem, I assume. And you're always recording in H.264, probably. I guess you can. Can you do ProRes now in the latest? Yeah, on the Apple, on the Apple on the, phone, on the iPhones. iPhones yeah. mm -hmm. On the iPhones, the new you can one, definitely the new do 422, I think HQ. So it's it, you can definitely chew up that that drive really really fast. <laughs> so it's it's a uh, it's quite capable. Um, I you know I think that uh, the problem the, the problem is I really like not having to put uh, any camera up to my eye. <laughs> you know, so even when I'm shooting, if I'm shooting handheld, I'm usually got the camera far, further away. And what I really like about the phone is having it further away. And what I like about the phone is putting it into a gimbal or putting it on other things or rigging around the screen. So I, I think that the problem for me is that I don't know if I would want to do what it's doing, but I can see filmmakers, traditional filmmakers, thinking that that was cool. Uh, next question. Next question is from Brody Brazil in San Francisco. My A10 Mini Pro ISO has been great in the home studio because it's virtually silent. Family only makes noise during firmware updates. How loud is the A10 Extreme by comparison under normal uses? Thanks. Go ahead, John. I've honestly never had the fan kick on unless it's a firmware update. Uh, one of the things that we recommend here is just turning down the brightness of the lights that actually will reduce the heat output of the device a lot and uh, will avoid any kind of spillover onto you if that's something you care about. Um, but honestly, as long as it's kept out of the direct sunlight, you shouldn't have really any noise. Go ahead, Mitchell. What John said, and if you have issues uh, with the extreme 
Um, the PK-1 Extreme is a good uh, uh, device to uh, set your Extreme up on top of. But I had to get rid of this when I got my shuttle because my uh, Hyperduck shuttle makes a nice, clean line to it. Yeah, the uh, um, I'm working on yeah a printing <laughs> printing something that's going to lift mine up, but uh, but I haven't had I I hear the fan every once in a while right after it's been turned on for a little while like it seems like it runs for a little while and then it just stops, uh, but I have really haven't had a problem with it at all. Uh, next question, Jen Zolson in Sandpoint, Idaho, ask what is the best way to get an Apple TV audio into an X32 with Dante card? I uh, go ahead, Tom. Well, it depends. If you have an Apple TV Gen 3, it has an optical audio out, but probably not likely. So you'll want to go to something like this HDMI audio extractor and uh, use it to get your audio out. Yeah, and it also depends on how many channels you want to get out of it. So, um, so the one thing that you may have trouble with is that you, so there are a handful of AV receivers that will have XLR outs. So they're designed to work with powered speakers as opposed to um, you know, running uh, speaker cable into them. Um, I, uh, Denon used to make one that you might be able to find on eBay. Uh, there is, um, the Mono Price has had one and it's been back ordered for so long that I don't know, I haven't looked at it recently, but the Mono Price had one that was, that was 16 channels out. So you could do a full 916 out. And so basically the, um, so if you wanted to pull out let's say the surround to the speakers, you could do that. Now you have to remember that the, that is being tuned to a certain room, you know, so if you're getting Atmos coming in, if it's not just a speaker, if it's 5.1 or 7.1.4 or 5.1.4, or and those are all actual channels that were encoded, then it is just is what it is. But if it's Atmos, then it's making decisions about the volume of coming out of each one of those XLRs um, separately based on the tuning that the AVR did when you, you know, in your room. So when you get those surrounded, they're not just the raw audio that comes out. It's the audio that is designed for that room. So you could theoretically pull as many as 16 channels out, um, you know, from there because it's an HDMI in carrying that Atmos into a receiver and, uh, and then it comes out the channels. Not that I've ever had to do that. <laughs> Next question. Next one in from Jens Olson in Sandpoint, Idaho. Is there a good Dante amplifier that would power 12 Bose in-ceiling speakers and two Bose, uh, excuse me, yes, two Bose MA-12 line array loudspeakers? Uh, Mitchell? Um, hopefully you haven't made that purchase yet because the big thing now in uh, ceiling speakers, certainly, um, is to get power over Ethernet and to have some type of an IP-based distribution system the advantages of which are you can control each individual speaker's volume separately, and it's a much cleaner installation. Um, if you already have the speakers, um, Barracks makes a little device that you can clip on the speaker above the ceiling that will turn it into an IP-based speaker system, uh, and it provides power with power over Ethernet. Yeah, and what, the other thing to look at if you've already got the speakers is uh, look at the Harman Kardon solutions specifically related to uh, crown amps, you know, those all sit not necessarily on Dante, but they sit on the blue network, which is a, an internal network that, that they use there. And then that's what like, like we manage a bunch of our stuff in the office with a BSS 806 that sits on both Dante and blue. And you can, they have a bunch of different converters and they have a bunch of different ways of processing it. Um, so that if you already have the speakers, that's probably the solution that you want to think about is some, some crown solution is probably going to be the easiest one to get from one to the other. Uh, next question. Next question in from Steve Uroff in Madison, Wisconsin. Would a Meta Porthole be a worthwhile quality upgrade for family Zoom calls compared to using a MacBook Air's native camera, speakers, and microphones? If you can find one. I don't think that they're making them anymore. So I think that they, they announced in June that they were um, that they were they were discontinuing them, I believe. So I don't think that, that, that that's an that's an option at the moment. Um, so so that I would I would go probably for an iPad. Um, you know, that's probably the, the direction I would I would consider. Next question. Next question from Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas. It's Black Friday. What are your best deals? I don't know. I, I'm, you know, the, typically I go through and I see if there's a Waves plugin I haven't bought. Um, you know, to you know, Isotope's got some good good ones. We talked about those yesterday. Um, there's a 10% off, I think, on MakerPipe. I think that I got some email about that because uh, I don't know. I have a lot of. I, I still. I'm. I'm slowly. My my ha my room is slowly turning into a MakerPipe uh, craft <laughs> craft project. Um, and so uh, so that that that's there. I'm not sure of any. Does anyone else have any other ones? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, Guy's not here today with us, but the DVE store, of course, 
uh, has oh, a have lot one. of uh, Black Friday sales on now. They've got some, looks like a road mic for now $138 or That's deity, great. excuse me, a deity. You know, so they go there and you can find a whole bunch of deals on microphones, it looks like. Huh? That's awesome. Very, very good. Um, I go ahead, Josh. Uh, I got a uh, email with the shocks, um, open, open comms, open mm -hmm. uh, things. I saw a forty dollars off coupon for some. Ooh, of them, so. that's good. That's very good. Go ahead, John. Uh, I, I'm just, I just get look going through my inbox here. I've got uh, Resolu Marina fifty percent off, four hundred bucks. Wow, for Arena, that's really cheap. And then my friend who's got a local uh, electronic store here in Vegas is selling 85 inch TVs for 1100 bucks. Man, remember when 85 inches was like, it was like 20 grand. Like no one's ever gonna buy one of those. And it turns out they will. <laughs> Next question. Next question in from Guy Cochran in Seattle. In playout B, how can I mark the in and out points to play just a section of a long clip? Go ahead, Jonas. Yeah, so this is one of the features that we just uh, today released a video about for the upcoming version two uh, that guy's mentioning. And in the upcoming version, it's not only a, a dark mode, but you can also go into here and set in and out points for clips. So that way you can trim and uh, move it. You can change the volume, say what it should do next, if it should loop or if it should go to a holding slate and all that. And uh, now even supports images. And now we Super hope to nice. release that within the next uh, month or so. That's fantastic. And that is uh, what platforms? Every platform. And uh, we've spent the last year rebuilding it so we can uh, also do platforms that don't have a device driver. So you can just host it as a server on a small device and then pull uh, HTML uh, outputs off it. And so you, it's Raspberry PC, Mac, Linux? Yes, we're working on the Linux build, but uh, that's one of the goals that you then can just have a little server somewhere and ever, you can pull it into Casper CG, into vMix, into OBS. Does it do key fill if you're, if you're bringing the cap? Or it doesn't do key fill? If you bring it into Casper CG and set Casper CG up to output key fill, it can do key fill. Wow, that's very cool. And how, what's the cost? Right now it's 50 bucks. And if you're... Uh, Use the coupon code that I just put into the chat. You can get thirty five percent off right nice. now. And yeah. great. You're, you're slowly passing the hyperdeck. <laughs> it was started off as I have a hyperdeck without having to pay for a hyperdeck, and now it's like I, I don't know if I want to go back to the hyperdeck. It's very good. Uh, go, great work, Mitchell. I have two hyperdecks, and my biggest <clears throat> pardon me complaint about them is playlist management and being able to top and tail them, uh, as the questions suggest. And um, I would think it'd be cool, uh, Jonas, if you could offer a uh, image on a uh, SD card for us Raspberry Pi users. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. And for our current PlayLP P licensees, is there an upgrade path or is it an additional fee or is it a free upgrade? Version 2.0 is going to be shared free with everyone that bought PlayLP in the past. And further going, uh, you will have at least 12 months of free updates uh, from your passive time. Applause. Well done. Well done. Um, Thank next you very question. much. Next question from Jens Olson in Sandpoint, Idaho. What projector would you recommend for a 60-person auditorium with two large screens? The budget is $10,000 for both projectors. Go ahead, John. I'll post a link, but the Sony laser projectors are really great. Uh, definitely go laser if you can over anything else. The color is going to pop. Uh, typically, the brightness rating for a traditional projector is uh, based on the white color output and not the color. So you're getting 30 to 40% of the actual output. A laser, you're going to get that full color spectrum output. Uh, I'll post a link in the chat to the Sony, uh, what is it here? Sorry, VPL PHZ60. Go ahead, Mitchell. I agree with John. The, the laser is the way to go, but the problem is the budget doesn't uh, fit that. $5,000 for a laser projector, I don't think you're going to find it. Um, I'd rather see you uh, combine uh, one projector for 10000 and maybe you're a little closer to a Sony or a Christie or a Barco. John, John, have you seen them, the laser projectors for less than five, five grand? Yeah, the one I post is actually 3500 uh, for 6,000 wow. lumens. So in a dark theater, that should work out pretty well. And in the past, there's been a lot of concern around laser projectors if they're in the line of sight for an eyes. Is that still a, is that still a concern for those? 
I have not heard that, but I, I would think anything at that number, no, uh, high of brightness would be a problem. Yeah, I mean, just, that's just the thing to remember is that is that the I know that I work in per, like theater um, projectors, and we definitely worry about people getting between the the projector and the and the screen and looking at it. It's it, the damage, the permanent damage is pretty happens pretty fast. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, it depends on your interpretation of a laser. There were the original laser projectors that actually use scanned uh, lasers mm -hmm. for generating the image. And the new ones are laser light source, which use a laser to illuminate a phosphor, which generates a white light that then goes through an LCD, which so it's a lot safer. But it depends on they're they're playing fast and loose with the term laser projector. So you got to be careful there. I'm curious about what. Um how big a 60 person auditorium is. It's not a, it's not an auditorium that we would ne that usually put two large screens in. And I'd be curious how big those screens are, because I will tell you that if you can, you know, at this point, if, you know, I, I, I think that you could put 80 for 60 people, you could put two 85 inch monitors on either side and you would probably be able to cover 60 people. I mean, I've, 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 I used to have a, an auditorium that held 80 and an 80 inch would have definitely been enough. You know, like we had, we used a, uh, I mean, we used a, we projected onto a, um, to a single screen, but, but I, I don't know if we needed to, I would have put 285s easily uh, would have worked. It depends on how wide and, and large, but they're a lot easier to manage than projectors and they make, you know, so that's, that's the thing that I would, that I would say there. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Yeah. I just did the same thing at a church. I look at the space that they wanted to do and they wanted to put two screens up and I said, well, how many inches is that? And they said, 80 inches. I'm like, throw a TV up. Like, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Why do you want to deal with all this hanging extra stuff that's going to go into place, people getting in the way, dust, everything is going to go along with hanging, something like that. Yeah, I, I think real hard on that. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, it, wouldn't the screen also be part of that combination? I, a good weave or a good uh, reflection screen, especially if you're using laser, don't you have to use a very specific material for yeah, that? They're not that expensive. I mean, they're you know, they're not that bad. Um but the but I would daylight screens is what I mean what we've used in the past and and um, I mean that's the that's the actual brand <laughs> daylight is daylight screens and um, they I bought a lot of them and then I bought also just screen material um, so so anyway yeah I, I would think about that a little bit it, it's it's not um, yeah for sixty people I'd get screens so and I, I would have to know what the size of the the the, um, the the room is but I think that you'd find that be easier next question from Brody Brazil and San Francisco California. I've been an audio implements custom mold user for 20 plus years of broadcast work, but have to admit on my own live streams, I greatly prefer the DT770 headphones versus the IEMs. Haven't heard a lot on office hours about these underrated cans. Anyone else have them? Good, Mitchell. Those are the buyer uh, headphones and they're closed, which is good. Uh, the other thing that they have that my Sony uh, 7506s don't have is they're uh, like 250 ohms. And the reason that's good is if you're plugging headphones into different sources and things like that, you can blow them out. And the higher the impedance is on the, uh, the headphones, the better uh, chance that they're not going to uh, accept that uh, that load and, and blow up. Um, they have that higher impedance. And the best way to explain impedance in a very short time is it's the amount that it pushes back on uh, the power that it's delivering. Uh, the closer the impedance is or the lower it is, generally it's a, a more efficient transfer of power. So sometimes with headphones, better not to have an efficient transfer of power because power could blow up your headphones. Oh, John. Yeah, the DT770s, I have a pair as well. They are great. I will say that um, typically what I get for in-ears like I'm wearing today, I'm wearing the Shures, um, you get a lot of head voice. Uh, and then I use another pair of headphones when I'm at home uh, from 64 Audio. They actually have like a an open side to them. So they, are, they, they have a, a solid plug, one that does negative 20 and one that does negative 10, negative 10 of isolation. And those allow the, your ears to breathe a little bit. You don't get that head voice where you hear yourself like overly loud. And for our uh, uh, listeners, as a note, uh, we're cutting through these questions really, really fast. And we've got a great panel here. So uh, this is a great day to ask questions. Uh, go ahead, Bill. I think this is much about aesthetics as it is about performance. If you want the absolute best audio, you're going to be using a, something larger than an in-ear monitor because even the best ones, I mean, there are some that are ear molds around musical 
full range headphones. But for most of us who are using true in-ear monitors for just things like this program, you don't really need the world's best audio performance. And I've been surprised. I moved from the headphones that I use when we have a musical performance on to using a little uh, talkback style in-ear monitor. And I've gotten used to listening to it in such a way that I can actually hear or pay attention to things like the low end that I thought was missing for it. It's actually there. I just have to listen differently. That's been a weird like evolution of my thinking. You can adapt to what you're hearing and make it work sometimes if you know what you're listening for. Next question. Next question from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. What's the plan for Tom Ferguson's show that starts 15 minutes after office hours? Can Tom share his worksheets in advance on Google Drive so we can study them? Go ahead, Tom. Josh has mastered the art of if someone makes a suggestion that they can own the project. So here we go. We're going to take <laughs> last year's spreadsheet. That's what you get for we're saying, we should do something. He's like, oh, why don't you do it? <laughs> yes. Uh, last year, you developed some spreadsheets for the suggested 1K through 20K uh, studio. And they were great. And yet this is a year later. And so as time goes on, new products are uh, introduced. And we also raise the bar from Office Hours 1.0 to 2.5. So what we want is Office Hours ready devices. And we're going to make up a matrix. And the matrix is going to be good, better, best. And then I'm going to have a fourth column for money is no object for those people who just want to be amused. And then we're going to take each category. A category would be your main camera or even an overhead camera, microphones and so forth. Uh, so I do not have a spreadsheet to share as of yet. We're gonna take this one category at a time. Would like everyone to join us. And let's talk about what is office hours ready. We're not talking about just hobbyists. That is, uh, that's really cool. And I, I can't wait to see the second hour that's based on this, uh, this little um, get together. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, would an external word clock generator like the Antelope's OCX HD, there's a link to it, uh, work as a master clock for a sound grid audio network? Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Any uh, complex digital audio network should have an external clock. And the problem is the good ones cost money. But uh, the difference in sound uh, are, are subtle for, in some cases and pretty dramatic in others. But for the most part, it uh, eliminates things like jitter and uh, rate uh, issues between drift that might happen between the different devices. So if you've got a complex system, particularly a sound grid system, um, I would make sure that they're all working on the same clock as the sound grid is. Yeah, go ahead, uh, uh, John. I agree with Mitchell. Uh, having an external clock is be very beneficial. Uh, you want to make sure that all the audio, all the frequencies are timed and aligned at the right time. Uh, that all your different sources that could be coming from different uh, input and output devices are also time aligned. It's going to make a huge difference in your audio quality. Yeah, and I, and I don't know. It Definitely you have to have a clock. I don't know enough about this one to recommend it, but it uh, it looks cool. So it looks it looks pretty, but uh, but I, I wouldn't know um, whether this is the right one or not. But it, we, we should definitely do. We should put that. Someone should put it in the second hour suggestions. Probably be good to have a second hour on clocks so that we can talk about what they are and how they work and the, and what we're looking for there. Next question from Andre Dole in Berlin. Uh, can I work on more than one project at a time and resolve like rendering one and editing a different one at the same time? You. Uh, I don't know if I've ever done that before. Um, where I, So I have to admit that the rendering, typically, if you let it run on Resolve, is going to want to use all of your processor. <laughs> so so it's going to want to, you know, and so if you start doing something else, and, and I've not opened that up, um, you know, I jump between a lot of um, stuff, but usually I rendering for me means I'm going to walk away for a little while and do something else, or I'm going to jump onto another computer. I usually have well, I've got four computers on the desk right now. So so I go to another CPU typically if I'm going to um, render and do something else. Um, I usually don't work on, on two of them on the same. And I don't do that for a lot of things. Even if I have two different apps on a computer, I could, the compression process in general or the rendering process in general, uh, whether it's a 3D render, a compression, et cetera, all of those things are very computationally expensive. And usually they are very efficient at using 
all the processing of your computer. And if you start doing something else, really slows them down. It's kind of like, you know, it, it just doesn't do anything well. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, if you have the license management, you can um, do some farming for render farming or offload projects to another device, which is what I recommend. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. I'd be concerned about doing two things on one computer, especially rendering uh, or uh, encoding, because you're going to get drop frames uh, if the computer gets maxed. I don't think, yeah, you might get them if it gets maxed, but but I don't think you're usually going to drop frames. You just get everything runs slow and clunky, and you'd be better off just going to get a coffee. Uh, next question. Next question from J.J. McKenna in San Rafael, California. Are there any other products that Jonas is working on other than Playout B? Go ahead, Jonas. So we, um, apart from the paid products, we also have been uh, working hard on contributing to the open source community. So we just uh, open source three of our libraries that we use internally. That's the Sumo C JS library that works with Sumo C to enable um, easy programming with that. Um, our globe that we developed half a year ago is now fully open source for anyone to use, and a gamepad library. And uh, we also, uh, I also uh, open source something on the um, Office Hours Global uh, GitHub that is the Zoom chat proxy that is used for getting Zoom chat from um, Zoom OSC or Zoom ISO and putting it into HR graphics or serve it up for vmix or any other graphic system and that also works with questions from a webinar that's great uh, next question from guy cochran in seattle usa besides buying a monoprice 8x8 hdmi matrix how else could i test six of the most popular usb capture cards with the same hdmi source go ahead courtney well i was thinking about this and i don't know if the h the you, uh, the HDMI matrix would do you any good because what you want to check is that this, we're talking about these uh, capture uh, HDMI to USB converters. So you want to test them on the USB output, not the HDMI input. So you want uh, to capture several of those. Yeah, but I think, I think though you, you want to have one, you want to have one cap, one in, input going into something and have six of them coming out that are identical. Well, you, you could do that. What I was going to suggest is just record the output of the USB and plug each one in, record the same test patterns going in through that USB input and record them on your computer in QuickTime, for example, and uh, then edit them together um, in post. That way you'd have a comparison of each one using the identical chain and the identical USB and the identical... Mm -hmm. uh, recording situation, and the only thing that's changing is the HDMI input. And since you've got to plug each one of them into a different, uh, you know, converter to USB, that's where the conversion to USB is where the difference in quality is going to be. So that way you could place them side by side editorially later, but you couldn't live switch between them very easily because they're all right. USB output. Yeah, go ahead, John. If you're looking just to get the same source across, an HDMI splitter is going to be much more affordable than a matrix because uh, all you're worried about is one input, to six outputs, eight outputs, whatever it is. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more affordable than a matrix that will allow you to route those to multiple devices. Go ahead, Jonas. Let's say you probably want to get like a test generator that can work with different HDMI edits just because... A big problem with the USB captures is how do they react to the different inputs. And you might uh, change your results by sending it through a matrix who tries to fix a lot of things um, so you don't have an uh, interruption there. Um, you could also use a test generator like that then to just test uh, HTCP. And then uh, you could also, and then I would add uh, like more practical tests to that, like, hey, we have a Mac uh, laptop and you plug it in how fast do you get a signal and how does the signal look like a real world test after you've done the technical tests? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, next question. From Andre Dole in Berlin, what does the REF connection between an ATEM constellation and an hyperdeck do and what do I gain by connecting it? Good, Bill. Typically, that's an engineering reference signal that is often tied to something like house sync, uh, was sometimes called black burst in the video world. It's a timing thing that it makes sure that when you're switching signals, everything is on the same starting point technically. Next question. Rick Combs, is there a way to transfer YouTube accounts from one person to another without losing all of the content? Hey, go ahead, John. 
Give them the username and password. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can also, I think that you can you can go through and, and you can make someone, you know, bring somebody in, make them a manager, make them admin, make them owner. And so you, you should be able to define them as the owner of that channel. Um, and then you're no longer the owner of that channel. I don't know if you can have two. I, I, I can't remember whether there were, at a time there, what you couldn't do that, but I'm not sure what, what the current, I haven't had to transfer something to somebody else anytime soon, but yeah, that, and, and by the way, if you're going to give someone access to your, to your site, you don't want to give them your login. And there's a whole bunch of reasons not to. Um, but, but main, the main thing is, is not only are you giving them your, unless you change the login, not only are you giving them the, the access to it as the owner, but you're also giving them how you build passwords. So people make a mistake of just sending, as the receiver of lots and lots of passwords, people will send, you, I now do everything I can not to, not to get one. I'm like, hey, make me a manager. <laughs> you know, like I don't need to, you know, you don't need to make me, you don't, I don't need to take over your site. Um, and I do everything I can to avoid it. And some people are just used to it, but it's really not a good idea. Because again, someone could, if someone sees that in the open, especially don't email it, but if someone, sees that in the open internet, what happens is, is they, they can look at uh, someone who knows what they're doing, can look at that password and understand, especially if you do something really simple, like, you know, a creative way of using camel caps or using uh, numerals for, uh, for alphabet, you know, you know, like doing swaps and stuff like that. If you're doing that kind of stuff, it means that they can start guessing. It makes it a lot easier for them to guess your password. <laughs> so, so, uh, so just, um, so just be careful of, of, of doing that. Next question. Next question from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. What's your power management strategy for the ATEM? How often do you turn it on and off, and how do you keep it cool? Good. Courtney? Well, I, I went the engineering way, and I put my own switch on it. I have this little bridge. This is the old my old setup with the Samsung. And I, the 12-volt strip light that's underneath that bridge that lights up the mixer below it is hooked into the power supply from the ATM. So I plug that into there. And on the back, you, which you can't see, there's a toggle switch, which toggles a jumper that, that plugs into the ATM. So I flip that power switch on. The light comes on. The ATM powers up. And... Uh, that's how I manage my power. And I use the original ATEM power supply to power all of it. And pulling those 12-volt uh, strip of LEDs underneath doesn't seem to phase it. I turn down the uh, brightness of the LEDs on the buttons to keep the ATEM cool. Go ahead, Mitchell. A uh, while back, Tom Ferguson shared with us a uh, inline switch uh, that uh, plugs into the back of the ATEM because the problem with cycling the ATEM is you have to unscrew that power uh, connector and then pull it out, turning off the power on and on uh, in front of the uh, the wall wart for the uh, ATEM um, is not a good way, only because there might be some re residual power in that block uh, still powering some part of the ATEM at a lower voltage. So uh, when you want to do a recycle, it's best to have a switch. I'd show it to you, but then I would turn my picture off. So uh, that little uh, switch is a handy little device. Good, Bill. I do basically the same thing Courtney does. I have a master switch. It is a master that controls eight additional plugs, with uh, which are also individually switched, but the master cuts them all off. I do that at the end of the show every day, so my ATEM goes dark along with the rest of my system. The next day, I power it back up. The only downside to it is that every day I have to do a real quick uh, reprovisioning of my ATEM with all of my graphics and everything because it loses that stuff. But that takes a minute and a half or two minutes, and I think that's a good balance to keeping it off for 11 out of the 12 hours in a cycle. Uh, go ahead, Tom. That inline switch, is a, if anyone's looking for it, is still on eBay. Just put ATEM inline switch. It's $10 and about $12 shipping to the U.S. because he's in <laughs> Canada. <laughs> Very good. Uh, yeah, and, and I, uh, I, I just plug mine into the into the power source that I have. I have a power source on my desk for everything on the desk. And uh, it gets turned off a couple times a week because I'm working on it. I'm working on the system, but that's about it. Now, next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, Plugin Alliance has a limited time deal with all their plugins at $799. For someone who already has the Waves Mercury, would the PA plugins be a useful addition? Go ahead, Bill. 
Well, I was reading this and I'm not that familiar with the Plugin Alliance. If it's a main company by itself and takes responsibility for the quality of all its plugins, it may be a perfectly good thing. My concern is if it's an alliance where there are a variety of plugins, I have found one of the things that vexes me more than anything else is finding a plugin that I've gotten into my system somehow that was coded not particularly well. They can be really vexing and I've had to jettison plugins. So for me, the quality of the operation that is producing and, and selling or marketing the plugins is very important. There are three or four plugin manufacturers that I trust totally. I know they're going to code them correctly. And as the system updates, they will revise their code to make sure it continues to work and they do not become toxic over time. That's my big concern with bulk packages if they come from various vendors. Hey, go ahead, Mitchell. I'm with Bill on this. That makes sense. I, I trust Waves and Isotope. And once in a while, I'll go out for something uh, some something unusual or special, like the uh, Perfect D Clipper, for example, made by Hans von Suppen uh, over at Thimio. Uh, but generally, I try to stay in my uh, my comfort zone because I don't know what I'm getting. Like Bill says, you don't know for sure. Yeah, I think for me, it's Waves, Isotope, and Synaptic are the only ones that I really um, think are running in my system. And that, now that I look, look, now that I look at it, <laughs> so so I don't know enough about these ones. Next question: Roy Myers in Bel Air, Maryland asks, "Will Fridays with Ferguson, <laughs> aka Tom's Tech Tackle, be recorded?" Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Uh, specifying equipment is borderline religion. So the answer is no, <laughs> we will not be recording this. Uh, we will be publishing the matrix and I will take discord editions, however. Well, and I think that a second hour makes sense. I think, I think that once, once we think about it a little bit, I think that I would love to see a pattern of us having a bunch of discussions in after hours, thinking about those things and then coming up with a matrix and then coming on for a second hour and discussing that matrix and then answering questions. I think that would be a, a really, um, really great way to, to do content. So, so let's stay tuned for that. Next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana asked, trying to post an Amazon short link, but it was blocked. Can we whitelist a company for posting Amazon links? You know, we had a lot of trouble with it in the past. That's why it doesn't exist. <laughs> so the so Mukana, I assume you're talking about Mukana. Um, and so uh, we we don't um, we don't do we don't support. It was just the easiest way to uh, not support uh, um, affiliate sales. <laughs> so people were really excited about using that, and so that's why it got blocked. And so um, and there's a whole bunch of things related to that that get blocked. So um, apologize for that, but it probably won't change. Next question. From Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana, a math teacher here wants a USB document camera in two locations in her classroom. How would you do it? USB document camera. I mean, it is a, the, I mean, the one that I like a lot, of course, is the, is the you know, it, you don't need probably that much, but the, um, you know, the, the little link from Insta360, because you can adjust things. You can sit there and go, Oh, I'm going to grab this. Now, of course, getting a long enough USB cable is the is the thing. So you'd need either a fiber USB cable or some kind of converter to pull that back. Um, you could probably get away with a Brio um, that's going to be over there. And you know what you want to look for is a document stand that you can put it on. Now the the link will do a um, will will correct for that. So if you have it'll corner pin and and um, you know key, uh, keystone um, a, a an image. So if it's not quite right, you can make that adjustment. But the um, but if you use a regular webcam, you're going to need to figure out a way to get it right over it. And what you're looking for is some kind of document cam, which is basically a platform with a with a column and a mount. And that mount and and that's going to let you apply any camera right over top of of the documents that you have there. Um, so thinking through that, and you definitely want to have a camera. I would definitely look at a 4K version so that you can um, you know zoom in and out a little bit to adjust for the different page sizes. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, probably what you want to look for is something called a copy stand. Uh, you can get them at most like Sammy's camera, any of the camera stores that sell them. And then just take your DSLR that has an HDMI output and put it out, or it has a USB output uh, or an HDMI output, and uh, put your DSLR on that. And that way, if you have a modern day DSLR that has a viewfinder on it, you can adjust, you put the viewfinder, flip the viewfinder around so you can see it as you're adjusting your stuff on your table. And then that feed goes back up to the uh, Back to the teacher's desk, and she can switch between the two. HDMI, you could probably run 
30 to 40 feet width without any problem and USB with a little uh, with a little extender it's USB 2.0 so you can run it uh, 30 feet with a little amplifier inline amplifier uh, those USB extensions are available fairly cheaply under ten dollars go JJ I would uh, virtualize the entire thing in Unreal Engine and I'd create a <laughs> fake environment, digitize the thing ahead of time. Right. How would I do it? That's how I would do it. There you go. The question. Remember with a copy stand, one thing that's really important are the lights. So there, a lot of times you can get two columns of lights on either side that's going to give it a nice... Um, it's going to give it a nice uh, uh, lighting from it, you know, for a, co for a variety of different print areas. Next question. Next question from Douglas Carmichael. Deutsche Telekom has Zoom X... There's a link to it, which is a version of Zoom run within their network. When would you use it, and when would Zoom OSC ISO work with it? Go ahead, Jonas. My understanding, Zoom ISO and Zoom OSC should work with it just fine because it's just a flavor of Zoom that is based on the same architecture that should be uh, able to use uh, apps from the uh, marketplace. You would use it as soon as you have anything in Germany that is uh, not wanting to have their data fed through U.S. data centers. Next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana asks, what Visa adapters have you used to go from baby pin to Visa? Currently using the Impact ME 10108P, looking for more options. Um, uh, yeah, I just bought them. Your timing is amazing. <laughs> So hold on, hold on a second. Let me let me see if I can find it here. Is someone else? Uh, go to the just go to the next question. But you're some, no one's got the hand up. Okay, go ahead, Co Co Courtney. You can talk a little bit, and I'll see if I can find this for you. Okay, well, if you have a 3D printer, you can print your own, which is what I did. And then I have a uh, my own special good sound uh, baby pin to three eighths inch uh, post that plugs in there, and then it goes right onto a post, and you can adjust the angle and. Uh, all 3D printed in uh, carbon fiber PLA. So there you go. Custom, custom. Made. Go ahead, Bill. Um, also, uh, maybe check out the Marker Tech catalog. Marker Tech is a company that has all sorts of little uh, solutions for things like this. I would go to their catalog and search on Baby Pin and see what they have in terms of that and visa mounts. So I now own three more of these. <laughs> I used to own probably a hundred of them in Pixel Core. Um, you know, so we use these all the time. This is a metal one that is built by Film Tools. It is not inexpensive. It's like 50 or $60. Um, but we have used it. So you can see I just bought it because it still has the screws like, taped to it, which is really nice. You'd be surprised at how many times you get a visa mount without screws. Anyway, so um, uh, this is a... Um, yeah, this is the uh, 60, well, I think I got it for sale on some kind of sale, but $66. This is the Film Tools Visa Mount Kit, 100 millimeter. They make a 75 millimeter. This is, we've used these, again, all over the world. This piece in the center will screw out, so you can actually unscrew the center, the center piece, the baby pin part, um, so that you can, it just packs easier. <laughs> so, so you can uh, do that, and I swear by these. I've had a lot of different versions of them, and I've broken lots of different ones and had them not quite fit. The Film Tools one has worked really well for me, and I bought three of them because I'm gonna. I want to suspend three more monitors down below, and I was gonna. I'm gonna run a, you know, run a, a bar across it and, um, and attach it. And so anyway, so they're they're super useful. Um, I would I would own, at least one of these all the time. You'd be surprised at how many times. Because what's great is, oh, I want to put a monitor somewhere. You now have a C stand. You just take the arm, you throw, a knuckle on it, and you throw this in here, and you're done. You know, and it's just, and now the monitor just floats around wherever you want to put it. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I just check on MarkerTech and eImage AEI A71 Visa to 5 8 inch baby pin adapter is available for 99 bucks. Yeah, and this one, this one's a little less expensive than that. This is a $66 list. And again, Film Tools makes it. They're out of LA. Uh, I like B&H. I just want you to know there are certain places that you have to be very careful of not going into without warning. Um, film Tools... On location sound, B and H, I walk in and it's just I can't walk out without lots of things and a lot less money. <laughs> the temptation <laughs> it is, is strong in those places. Oh my! Oh my goodness! The the you know those those three locations that and Akihabara in in, in in Japan. Those are the places that are just taking an incredible amount of of will to walk in and out without buying lots of little things. So anyway, but uh, if you're in LA, uh, uh, I to, to back up. If you're in LA, Film Tools is a pretty cool place. Anyway, but but they 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 make and sell these. Next question. 
Next question from Tommy Shantz in St. Paul, Minnesota. If you put a video wall or large monitors in a live stream, what do you need to know so you don't have any issues? Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Well, the first thing, I'd make sure that all the uh, video sources are synchronous. So there's a number of ways of accomplishing that, which go beyond the uh, scope of this question. Uh, go ahead, uh, John. When shooting a video wall, it's very important to understand the pixel pitch, what distance you're going to shoot from, how close your subject will be to the wall. Uh, getting more is very easy when you're shooting a video wall. If you're using multiple TVs, make sure everything is in the same color balance. Um, typically, what you'll have with like legacy video walls that were used with video panels um, is color shift between the panels over age. And so that's definitely something to consider. Uh, even when you're doing uh, different IC batches with LED walls, there could be color shift as well. Uh, so just making sure that you understand what that looks like, uh, that everything is clear, that you have enough light TVs and LED walls are much brighter than typical light sources you're going to have on people. Uh, so just understand those concepts and you should have some success. Go ahead, Courtney. And you might want to gen lock your camera to the signal that's feeding the video walls so that you're at the same frame rate. You're not going to end up with any kind of flicker or any kind of artifacts or breathing brightness. If your shutter uh, shutter angle on your cameras uh, are not exactly at the same uh, shutter rate or shutter speed as the frequency of the vertical refresh of those monitors. Yeah, Genlock is important. Also, you might want to look for some cameras have low pass filters that are going to help um, a little bit with the Murray. Um, so look for those as well. Um, you're really looking for typically one, 1 1.7 mil is what is the minimum is the the largest pitch that I'll put behind someone unless I have a lot of distance behind them and 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 this is expensive so these get down to about 0.9 this is when you say a 0.9 mil or 1.7 mil this is the num number of millimeters between each pixel that's there and so as that increases um, you end up with a couple different problems. One problem is the Murray, which is the biggest problem. And if you watch any Samsung uh, keynote, you'll get to see lots of it. Samsung, I don't know if they if they know that there's Murray there or not. <laughs> like, like, I don't really understand. But every time they do a keynote, I just look at all this big Murray going across the, the back behind them. Um, the um, anyway, 0 0.9 is about as small as it gets, um, and those don't those don't curve, and they are super expensive. Um, and what the typical uh, high end uh, is about 2.3 to 2.6, and then the older ones are 3.2. These will all um, tend to moray. Um, the other things that will affect that is not obviously your specific zoom. So it will only moray in certain zoom zoom angles. And so a lot of times, what we do is we end up. You just have to be very careful. You know, know you're going to have a slower edit because what you're going to do is you're going to zoom through the moray and then stop. And you're not going to get big zooms pushing in because that's where you're really going to see the moray appearing and disappearing. Um, so uh, against that frequency. And so what you have to do is, you know, you have a lot of cam you have a couple cameras and you're going to figure out where those places are that you can't be in, in at a given angle. Curved screens are more complicated because the, the, that, that zoom angle and how it affects the screen is, is it changes uh, along that surface. Um, cameras at an angle are also more complicated because of the same reason. So those are the things you want to kind of think through. Um, the other thing is, is that larger frame sensors and then a deeper stage will help you a lot. So you want to drop as much of that screen into the, into the bokeh as possible. And so, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of math that we used to do that would be, you know, I'm using a super 35 sensor or a two thirds inch sensor. Definitely do not use anything smaller than a two thirds. And generally super 35 is going to make your job a lot easier um, uh, for most environments. And so, um, but the, but the, anything smaller than a two thirds, a half inch, quarter inch, they're going to rain all the time, <laughs> you know, just because too much is in focus. Um, the other thing to know is that even if you're not getting Murray, if there is any texture, and I mean any any texture in an LED wall, it'll destroy your live stream. So basically, um, it will basically the the temporal compression will be absolutely defeated by the by the LED wall behind it. Now, in a post in your VOD with a little bit more time, it may come back and be, look okay. But if you're watching a live stream, what it'll do is it'll apply all the temporal compression to the background and the foreground person will come macro blocked and all kinds of really low red. They'll look very out of focus and oftentimes blocky um, because the, in, the encoder grabs onto that wall behind it. So it has to be, there can't be any texture. You have to really look at it and make sure, and it'll look fine in video, but the, the, the encoders will not, not like it. This has been a problem we've dealt with for a decade. Now go ahead, Courtney. 
Yeah, one other thing I was going to mention is if you are using large monitors that are LCD monitors, uh, as far as color balance goes, most of those monitors have a 9300 Kelvin backlight on them. So if you're shooting with, you have tungsten illumination on your foreground material or foreground people that you're going to include in that shot with the monitor, you're going to have to get them to the same white point. And if it's an LCD monitor and you're trying to correct it to 3200, what happens is because of the way LCDs work, uh, they have a little shutter that you know, adjusts the amount of light that's coming out of each pixel. And that shutter has dimension. And so that means as you drop your blue level down to get it up to the uh, uh, tungsten level, you got to attenuate blue down to about 20%. That means that little shutter is going to be almost closed on the blue pixels. That means your sweet spot for the correct color is going to be very narrow because as you change vertically or horizontally, depending upon how the uh, LCDs are aligned, you're, um, you're going to see a color shift as you go off axis out of the sweet spot. And that sweet spot is going to shrink uh, dramatically if you have to color correct from that 9300 to 3200 Kelvin. So that's really in the weeds, but uh, you're best off to get all the color temperatures matching between your uh, backlight and your and your uh, monitors and your foreground light on your subject. And finally, most of the time to try to avoid a lot of the problems that we're talking about, we usually request nine feet above where we start the screen. So we want the screen to be up nine feet and then go up there for the viewers to watch. We don't like screens behind the, the speakers at all. And we do everything we can to avoid that. That gets rid of most of the stuff, stuff we just talked about. <laughs> so, and, and have something nice and organic. The other thing is, it just looks nicer. Like if you, a nice organic background, people really think that the graphics behind people looks good. It, it's really distracting most of the time, especially if you put people like floating things or whatever behind the speaker. It is like other faces on an LED wall behind a speaker is very distracting it, because you're, you're fighting a million years of evolution. Our, we are designed to look at them. And so you're taking away from the, from the speaker when you put other faces behind them. Um, and so I highly recommend against it as someone who's worked on hundreds of these. Uh, next question. Samuel Nordvik from Norway asked, I'm trying to remote control the Zoom on a Sony A5100 via the multiport with an Arduino. Do you have any experience or thoughts? Go ahead, Bill, real quick. The only thought I have is that often places like Sony, and they're very good at this, has both a regular manual and a technical manual for their equipment. If you can get a hold of the technical manual, it may actually have the pinouts for ports in terms of being able to control various things. So look for that. Yeah, I'm not even sure. I, yeah, I'm not familiar with, I'm not sure which the 5100, is, is that a pro level or is that a um, consumer level camera? That's consumer. Yeah, you may have trouble getting much control over that. Go ahead, Josh. Um, I applaud your efforts, uh, Samuel. That is fantastic. Let me know how you make out on that. But yes, uh, the multi-port, which is a USB a mini B port, does have the power record and zoom functions in it. So if you knew what those Mm -hmm. commands were yes you could use an arduino to record it um interested to find out your results yeah let us know next question brian slatt in ann arbor michigan could you explain how you were syncing the audio and video of each individual panelist on office hours not yet <laughs> so we're working on it uh so we're, we're getting very close we're, we're we're working on getting that those small details out but eventually what we'll be able to do is use zoom iso to export those over dante then and then those have to be then we're figuring out where we're going to add that sync and i'm testing some stuff that actually this weekend that should help may help us uh do some of that and then we have to re re-embed it back to the signal and uh, we're working on all of that next question Stan Chan, San Francisco, California, asked, is there a use for black burst generators in a high-definition world, or does having a tri-level Genlock signal from a high-def device source be the ideal solution? Go ahead, Mitch. Still using black burst? Going strong. Go ahead, Courtney. A lot of uh, synchronizing devices will take either black burst or tri-level sync. Um, uh, you don't necessarily need a, you know, a tri-level sync signal. Uh, you can use just a regular SDI input for a lot of reference voltages as long as that SDI input is synced to your house sync. You can use that as a reference source as well. It doesn't have to be black burst necessarily. It'll pull the horizontal and vertical signals off of that SDI sync. Go ahead, Bill. 
Yeah, even when I was doing a lot of video back in the days of Black Burst, and it was almost universal, uh, people were coming out with devices called frame shakers that would do the sync separate from Black Burst. You could take a bunch of untimed signals, put them through the frame shaker. They would all come out perfect. So there are alternates to that. Black Burst is just still the simplest and easiest, and it's almost always available. And again, Josh, as we look into 2023, we should definitely do a second hour on reference, gen, you know, reference and Genlock, I think would be a great one for people to, to back up and explain what they are and how they work. Next question. Roz McNulty in Vancouver, Canada. What recommendations to consider for a second monitor mount? The best mounting positions that you like or don't like? My donated screen is about 22 inches. I think it depends on whether you have a visa mount or not. We were just talking about the, the visa mount is, of course, the four. If you have four screw-ins on the back end, and that can be either. It's almost always 100 millimeter, but it could be 75. And um, I use a Huano, I think. It's H U A N. U O. It's not the nicest ones. Um, they're about 80 bucks <laughs> and they have two arms. And now I can just kind of, I just, you'll see me kind of reaching off. Sometimes I'm swinging those monitors around and moving them to where I want them to be. And they, they work pretty well for me. Um, the next step up, that's a fair bit nicer are the Amazon. Amazon makes these monitor mounts that are a little bit smoother, move around a little bit, a little bit better than the Hoanos. Um, and then from there, it's monitors in motion, which just feel like the monitors floating in space. <laughs> so, so you just have, those are the kind of the good, better, best um, that I've worked with at least. Next question. Stan Chan in San Francisco, California. Are there other solutions for double-ended recording other than Riverside and Zoom's future feature? I don't know if there are any that I can talk about right now. So let, I, there, there may be one or two other ones that are coming. Um, but, uh, but I, I don't, I don't know that for sure. So, so let, let me, uh, I'll find out and we'll, we'll highlight it when it comes out. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael asked the Billie Eilish tour carried an all black magic design video system, including Ursa broadcast cameras and a constellation switcher. Considering the support and reliability record of black magic design gear, wouldn't you go with a higher end brand for a major tour? I have worked with the Black Magic gear all over the world. I would definitely do a, do a concert with Black Magic. Like, and and the and there's a couple of reasons for it. Uh, one is is that it's very flexible. So a lot of the other ones. So I shoot uh, a lot of the concerts I work on are either Aerie or Venice. So we we use a lot of those for for those types of shows. Um, and the problem is is that the, well the advantage of the Black Magic is is that it's it's just a much more flexible pipeline than the Aerie or the Venice. So you, they may be higher end, and they they definitely there's some color science advantages um, and a variety of other things. But they're but they are tweakier, <laughs> and the and the team that you put together will be bigger. And if one breaks, it's a big deal. Um, with the Black Magic, you're like ah, oh, we'll just put another one in. And a lot of times, what happens is is you end up with more more of the cameras. Uh, I have rarely had a black magic camera go down, like to be clear, and a, and a switcher in the last decade, um, rarely had any of those go particularly bad. Um, you know, there are, there have been some that we've gotten that are loaners or tests or rentals that haven't, haven't um, done as well, but, but usually it's been not the one that I bought. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, you covered a lot of the stuff I was going to point out. Black Magic, the price of the Black Magic, you can afford to carry spares around, whereas if you're using Aerie Alexas, you wouldn't want to carry spares around. Plus, you're trucking it. You're throwing it onto a truck and driving between cities. There's a lot of vibration and stuff. So uh, professional camera gear can get a little tweaky, so you're going to have to realign things every time you set it up. And with the Black Magic, it's prosumer stuff is pretty more pretty much fixed uh, in its mountings and everything else so um, the parts don't move around as much inside the prosumer cameras and it's easier to store a profile and just boot up and throw that profile in and have everything back to where you were at the last city uh, very quickly and like I said the backups are you take a second constellation switcher and, a, and two or three extra cameras along for the price of one of the higher end cameras next question Dan Chan in San Francisco asked, I have a dozen SDI 12G connections I want to run from my rack to my desk. Is there a way to organize it without making a messy bundle of cables? All right, go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, 12 is a lot to put into a snake. Um, I would break that down into two, maybe inputs and outputs. And they do make a uh, low-profile cable for 12G. Um, I would go to MarkerTech for a start. And then there's a bunch of other companies that make custom cables, but they vary in price greatly. Uh, go ahead, uh, John. You got to love Stan Shan. We have one of the top software developers on the planet run it, running 12G SGI cables to his desk. Love you, Chan. Happy holidays. <laughs> All right. 
We are now changing subjects uh, and talking about the Kilo Show. Uh, and uh, the Kilo Show, of course, is coming up December 19th. Uh, we are we don't know how long it's going to go, uh, but probably more than two hours. Uh, and uh, and we're going to um, really talk about the last thousand episodes. We have not missed an episode. We've had a couple close calls, but not missed an episode. In um, The only close call we had was uh, when Zoom didn't work uh, early on. I think that was the, the only one that was really that close was uh, you know, and, and that, and part of that is to, you know, really is an acknowledgement of the community, the community. It's, it's not a person like me just getting up there and going, oh, I'm going to do my thing. It is this huge organization of incredibly talented and uh, committed individuals that have been making sure that this happens every single day at, you know, a very high quality. And, and so, um, we have not missed a day. I don't know how many shows have done a daily show. Like, I don't, I don't have we researched that? Like how many shows have done like the same show, the same format, seven days a week. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that exists now that I think through it. Um, maybe, maybe there's lots of radio, I guess, that that has done something kind of like it. But, but anyway, the point is, is that we haven't missed one. We're not going to miss one between now and December nineteenth. I feel very confident in saying that, and I say that now. And now I'm probably I probably host the whole system. Don't so anyway, so the, yeah, exactly. We'll knock and knock on all the wood around us. We'll have to delay the killer show till another thousand. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so anyway, um, Josh, do you want to give us a little bit of an update? Sure. Yeah. So um, we talked uh, last week about um, you know what we're looking for people to contribute. We want to um, have things that are memorable to us. Um, different con- different things that people can contribute, like screenshots. And we've gotten some uh, some nice responses. Um, some folks have reached out and sent to, to me personally. Um, I want to. That's one of the things that we're looking at doing moving forward about getting this more in the in the open for everyone else. But um, have has sent some uh, different nice artifacts that we've had from the first year uh, of the show. There was one uh, particular one that's uh, we can sh- maybe share a little bit later, but it uh, talks about uh, you know everything up until the first September of it. So Laura, thanks for for sending me that. But um, people have uh, been contributing, and one one ways that you can contribute I want to show that is that in the email you'll notice that in the team opportunities. Um, the Kilo Show discussion thread is where you can, uh, it's a public uh, thread that anyone can can contribute there. So everyone has access to the Discord. You can put your different time things. I think Dave has a, a, a way of um, showing, a, showing us um, exactly how you can do that. So he can, he can demonstrate that. But that's how you can contribute different items into this show. Um, some of the other folks uh, that have done uh, office hours adjacent shows, some of our um, birding with Lois and our um, our other uh, uh, adjacent shows, they're going to give us um, um, little little summaries of the clips. So we've talked about last time, uh, thirty to sixty second clips is best. Um, there is room for for adding things that are that are along that, depending on on the content, but. If we can get a, a 30 to 60 second clip, that's best. In fact, some of the things that might require longer to tell the story, even if you can make a 30 or 60 second version of that clip, would be helpful for us. That way we can decide where it needs to go and you know put it into the different sections that we talk about. But uh, yeah, I think uh, Dave had some some other things to, to talk about as well. You go, Dave. Well, I guess my first remark was that I think every morning show on every local station has run probably a thousand. Um, they do it every not morning. every day. Well, not that's true. Day. Sunday maybe day. they wouldn't do. Yeah, yeah. No, they, they usually change the format on the weekends. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. So, um, yeah. In terms of contributions, uh, we're soliciting some, and we're accepting contributions sort of generically, and then we're going to have a process of assessing them and allow people to vote on them. I think uh, Josh is going to show us how that's going to go. Um, in terms of um, time and uh, how long a segment is, if you're not sure how long you can manage it, uh, that's why we've got some editors in the back to be able to sort of condense things and make them look and go faster. Uh, but uh, we also recognize that some of these descriptions are going to take longer than a minute to explain. And so we're going to be a little ease as to what the actual finishing time is. We're going to try and stick to the 60 seconds because we have a lot of show 
and we don't want to spend most of it watching videos. We want to talk about it. But in the sense that some things need a longer explanation as to how it evolved or why it came about, uh, we're allowing people to try and give us a long version and a short version, and then we'll see whether they work together. Yeah, and I think it's going to be really interesting to, to see all the bits and pieces coming together and what people send us. So definitely, um, you know, let us know uh, what you, uh, you know, definitely think about it. Reach out to Josh or Dave if you have any questions about what you could do or what you should do. If, so if anything we're not covering here during the during this update, um, definitely feel free to reach out to Josh and Dave and, and, and ask questions. And uh, we'd love to have um, submissions. Josh, did you have something else? I, our Q&A cycle got a little twisted up here. Um, no, I didn't have anything um, directly, although um, I will say that uh, there are some of the things that we were, were working on. Internally, we have a timeline that we're putting together that helps us to sort of uh, give a narrative um, thing. What we're looking at is a way to display that. Right now, it's, it's on our planning sheet. We have a, a planning um, spreadsheet that we have in one of the, the tabs is a timeline for that but there's many different timelines that you can make there's one of the the show there's one of the history of the progress of the technology of the show um, there's different um, uh, visitors that we've had different guests that we've had at different times and things so different ideas of things timelines are great um, and if you have any suggestions about how to do that um, you know we're open right now we're in a planning phase so opening up our our timing thing actually we have a little countdown there and it says 23 days, 12 hours and 50 minutes um, to the Kilo show. So we've got a little bit of time to where we can work with some things and bring some content in and put them in logical orders into the different segments that we have. Um, and I believe, um, Dave, you were going to talk uh, to um, just how long that window of contribution is open. Sorry if you've, if you've already stated that. Go ahead, Dave. No, I haven't, actually. Uh, we've agreed that uh, we'll, we'll be able to accept submissions right up until... December 9th. Uh, that's when we'll probably close the door and begin the process of uh, evaluating and processing and assembling all of the stuff that was suggested that we think was voted up high enough to be contributors. And I will say that, as with all things, the chances of your stuff being accepted and being part of the larger program uh, greatly increases if it's earlier than the ninth. <laughs> ninth is is aggressive, so it might be the hard hard limit. limit but I would really try to get something mm -hmm. in by the second uh, to make sure that, that the team has enough time to to really look at it. It may, it may particularly if it's if it's not been pre created. Uh, some of the groups might want to assemble their own sixty seconds, and right. if it is good and we like it, then it saves us a ton of time. Yeah, and, and there's just a lot of things that might not make it if it gets there in the ninth and it's not perfect. So so yes. definitely get it in early and get some feedback on it. That'd be great. Let's jump to the first question. First question in for Roy Myers in Bel Air, Maryland. Uh, do you have enough video submissions for your 1,000th shoe plans? Good, Dave. We'll stop at 1,000, I think. You know, um, the submissions have been coming in pretty strong and we're above 30. Um, but... We're going to be putting them from the suggested discussion submissions into a voting pile. And as we push them in there, we're going to give people an opportunity to thumbs up or we tell them we're working on it. And uh, after we get enough thumbs up on something, it, it raises its priority for being processed. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, and the type of submissions we're talking about are manifold. Um, they could be something that you put together, like Dave mentioned. Um, or what you could do is just simply um, draw our attention to a specific part of a video clip. So all of our regular OH uh, show is here on the YouTube channel. If you go into the previous channel, Alex's channel, you can find these uh, nice segments. Instead of telling us a timestamp to go in, and search for, what you can do is do the share button at the bottom and then you can actually mark that particular time. It'll, there's a checkbox in there that allows you to save at this point in time. Uh, there's another way to do it. You can click directly onto it. If you have the desktop view, you can click directly on it. It'll save this point. That'll give you a link that'll point everyone to exactly that point. That's nice because when you share that in the discussion thread, not only is it helpful for us, those that are pulling some of these clips out to put them into other clips, but other people can see you know, you, you, as you share that, you share it with the community and other people get ideas about, oh, that's right. You know, I forgot about that clip. Here's another clip uh, that I thought of too. So even on a, a mobile device, if you go into desktop view, 
you can uh, long press on it and that'll give you the option to share at that point in time. That'll help us to segment these different things. So it's not a real um, high barrier of entry just to share a, a nice uh, clip or a point. And you can share more than one of them. If, um, you know, if there's two or three segments in a single clip, just share two or three other links for that. That's helpful. Next question. JJ McKenna in San Rafael, California asked Josh, are there enough video editors available to work with the content provided? Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Well, I suppose we have enough when we have enough. So I don't know how much work it's going to be. I have one person who stepped forward to help us with this. Any other people who have editing gear in their system uh, can help contribute to that part of the process. We haven't set up a pool yet for where all the clips are going to reside, but when we do, then we'll share it with those people who step forward to edit and we'll distribute as people's time permits. Go ahead, Josh. Well, I raised my hand because the question was uh, sent to me, but yes, what, uh, what Dave said is true. Um, currently we do, we don't have a lot of clips to edit, but more clips, uh, more editors, always more better. <laughs> yeah, next question. Roy Myers in Bel Air, Maryland asks, uh, do you have enough volunteers for the 1000th show? And if not, what skill sets do you need? Uh, Josh, what are you, are, are we looking for anything? We are. So the show requires the same volunteers of any show uh, that we've done in the past. Um, Laura Thompson has volunteered to head up the crew, as she's done with uh, many of the other uh, crews in the past. We're going to right now, if you look on the volunteer sheet, um, we don't have yet the 19th is the next the next um, time we refresh our volunteer sheet. We'll see the 19th come into into the horizon of places you can edit. So we're going to block off. Uh, the 19th, that'll be a special show. And Laura has, uh, has offered to, um, to direct people, uh, to that. Uh, we don't have Laura on the show today, but there are some special roles that we're looking at, uh, taking advantage of, uh, for this. So, um, Laura's going to have, uh, an advanced, uh, question management, um, a team uh, to be able to manage things that we're going to get a lot of different questions and be able to bring up the correct question for the topic that we're, we're talking about. She's got a nice plan of, uh, of doing that. So w um, reach out to her as far as um, if you've worked on the crew in the past and you'd like to take on that role, uh, we may need more than one um, person for that role. So we'll, we'll see what volunteers we have and then see what capabilities we have with you know, the volunteers we have too. We also have JJ uh, on today, so he can talk to any um, you know technical uh, limitations and ways that we can facilitate things as well. But um, yeah, uh, if you ask uh, if you ask Laura, she'll have a separate sign up sheet for that for different this all of the reg regular roles we'll need. Uh, there may be an option too for shifts too, so there may be more than one person for that role, so that we make sure that we've got someone for all the other roles we have. There you go, JJ. So since we don't know how long this will actually run, uh, that's <laughs> kind of up in the air. Uh, and given that uh, some of the, we've slowed down, it's been a lot of folks slowing down for training. Um, we don't know really who will be available that Monday. So folks who continue to want to train, uh, please do uh, soon um, because that's, uh, we absolutely need folks who can consistently show up and learn the ropes and then uh, keep keep nugging forward as we we've been building this thing because one I, I and I honestly believe 1000 uh I don't think any show has ever done that live ever usually folks pre-record yeah. so this is amazing what we're yeah doing. I think that I, I I've been thinking about it and I'm just not sure if there's been another show like we we have to think about that maybe we can get again a spoken world record most live consecutive shows uh, the same format or something because I, I don't know if there's any any other one that, that's done that um, I, I know that in within 2000 I think we, we will definitely be <laughs> by ourselves go ahead Dave I I just wanted to say how concerned I am about the crew changeover uh, not everybody can commit for the whole show and so we're gonna have to as Josh mentioned we're gonna have to do a sort of shift structure and if people can shift in and shift out again 
uh, there'll be times during the show where we're switching over people who are doing question management or people who are doing TD even. Nobody can be uh, expected to stick around for a four-hour show and not have a break somewhere in the middle. But at the same time, we want everyone who can contribute to have a feel that they contributed to the 1,000th show. Hey, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, and um, just adding some color to JJ's comment about volunteers. Um, yeah, if you um, have already volunteered for these roles, uh, that's great. You know, we can plug you in to these. But if you have not, um, then um, the same, I'm going to reuse the slide. So just above there, the team opportunity, the first one listed is fill out this form and sign up for training. So if you've not um, done any, um, if you're interested in helping out with the production of the show, um, feel free. Hit that link that's in the, in the email under team opportunities and uh, we'll guide you through the process of, you know, we're not going to, we don't throw things at you, uh, especially at your first at bat. Um, you can watch and um, we'll uh, let you take the controls whenever you're ready to. So if you, if you've always been wanting to help out with the show. And if you have the opportunity, go ahead and fill it out. That'll put you in the, the short list of people that we can uh, reach out to, uh, to help us run the show. And if you have any uh, other questions, uh, we're cutting through these questions pretty quickly. And um, we, uh, if you, so if you have other questions or comments about the Kilo show, this is your time to share them. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. It'd be kind of interesting to get the statistics because if we found out we were more shows than say the Simpsons, we're in some uh, rarefied air there. Well, and we're maybe... not more shows. So what I will say is that it's not that we have more shows. There's lots of shows that have tens of thousands of shows that, that went out. It, it's really how many shows were done live consist consecutively, uh, you know, in the same format. And I'm not sure that there's any other ones out there that did that specific. It's not. It's not the number of shows. We're not even competitive in that area. But from my but, from a statistical standpoint, I thought it was interesting that if we have something to brag about a little bit, we're more likely to get uh, people to uh, wish us the best. Uh, and for our next one thousand shows, um, everything from the president to Elon Musk or anybody else, something that we can hang our hat on. And say, hey, this is a big deal. So it'd be good for you to you get know, on there you too. Know, Bragging is my favorite thing to do. Uh, anyway, go okay, ahead. Okay, but then I just wanted to be careful about how I posted it because <laughs> yeah. it's mine too. And that's, yeah, Josh. You know, you know, the thing about statistics is uh, it always boggles my mind when you're watching like a sports uh, cast and the you know the presenters have this thing in their ear where they're like, oh yeah, and that last catch was the um, was the most uh, consecutive catches by a single player on Thursdays. Like they've got these people that uh, can calculate like these very like, the, the devil's in the details, the very specific thing about what a statistic is. And um, I, I agree. Like there's there's been a lot of shows that have happened, you know well over over a thousand in the, into the thousands and probably more smaller shows um less probably so that have been consecutive and less of a certain size like after a certain threshold i but wonder how big but 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 the, the funny thing is I, i'm not sure i'm not sure if, if again i just don't know if another show has done it live in the same format that hasn't changed uh especially if you say video as soon as you say video i mean radio you could theoretically say there's a lot of channels that have just done done their same thing every day but video, I'm not not to totally certain because again, almost everything that runs seven days a week changes format or studio or something else. Um, you know, every uh, uh, on the weekends typically because the the team goes away. Go ahead, Mitchell. I just think the idea of some celebrities coming on and saying, wishing us best, like Bane. I if really don't jump, want anybody that no doesn't Bane? already know us. That isn't already no celebrity. To us. No, no. Elon no Musk. Just he's got to know us. Elon's no. got to know us. No, I'm not interested. President of USA. No, not interested. I think they're a little um, busy these days. Well, I just don't, I, I don't want to, uh, I, 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 again, I don't want it to be some random person that doesn't even know who we are and just doing it from Cameo or something like that. I'd rather have it be someone who actually knows us. Uh, yeah, I already Courtney. spent money on Cameo. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, go, Courtney. Yeah, they stopped counting at 2,500 shows, but 60 Minutes has been on for 54 seasons. Mm -hmm. So uh, did they do it, it every it's day. not live, but they do it every week. Uh, but the CBS Evening News or any of the network news shows that are done live daily. Uh, are probably, they daily? And, and they're not live. Like CBS News. Yeah, well, ABC they're tape delayed on the West Coast. but No, most, no, no. A lot they're tape delayed on the East Coast, too. I've been there. Really? I've sat in the ABC one. <laughs> well, there are a few minutes to 
uh, more than a few, like half an hour. <laughs> like it's it's not they're definitely not live, you know. So so the uh, I mean they they record uh, on the well, East Coast. the morning Coast. shows. The morning shows are live here. The West Coast edition, right? But they change live. formats on the weekends. Maybe the term needs to be real time because we are a so real time show. But but it's yeah. So the I mean because like ABC News I think records at five thirty, you know, like five thirty for a seven o'clock broadcast, you know, and that and. Uh, so they have like a full hour, I think, and because they have to, they have to. Usually, they'll end. ABC News, for instance, will end uh, oftentimes like heavier, short, heavier light by twenty seconds or something, and then they have. There's literally two people at ABC News that just sit there and talk about the fact that they're heavy or light, you know, based on whatever actually came out, and they're constantly trying to renegotiate how that happened. So you get to the very top, you're right at at it, but they're off a little, and then got to figure out where they're going to cushion it. And anyway, that's some of the story. Now, next, next question. From Douglas Carmichael, this segment from Office Hours Space, and he has a link there, tells the history of Office Hours beautifully. What about building on this theme? Do we still have the source media from that project? Go ahead, John. Yeah, we have all we have all of our assets in LucidLink and uh, Fenwick and Keenan. And several of us have access to that folder. We have all the assets. We have over a terabyte of of raw footage. And and that's a great video, Douglas. Good good find. That that would be a good one. I'll yeah. I'll package that up and send it to Josh. Outstanding. Thanks. Yeah. Next question from Dave Troutman in Edmonton, Cal- uh, California. Sorry, Canada. Almost made a new state. Uh, can John Preto share a little segment idea he had? Yeah, go ahead, John. <laughs> can I do screen share, Alex? Yeah, sure. Uh, now I want to say that the opinions on this keynote are all mine and. If anybody gets mad, they can get mad at me and not office hours. But but was it? Was, are, we, are we putting up politics? No, no, no okay. politics. This, but this is really kind of funny, and the guys thought it was funny too. Okay. So here's a little keynote that we put together about doppelgangers in office hours. <laughs> <laughs> I think they call that separated at birth, but that's yeah, just keep, me. Keep going. Yeah, look at that. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> T- TJ's going to get the hat for the thousandth episode. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I don't know if I that one. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that's fabulous. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> Very good. Here we go. John Sky Shy. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> I think everyone will have to approve their own. Yeah, they're, they're everyone that has a check mark on it has already been approved. Oh, that's great. Okay, yeah, yeah. cool. Anybody that's approved, I think it's fine. This really? comes you from <laughs> Dan Huber's Facebook page. Had this had this blue face on. <laughs> that's the menace. Jay Ward. Oh, they're like, that's good. That's good. Oh, sorry. <laughs> George, George, George saw this. George, George saw is this such one. a sweet guy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> See, now we're ruining it for everybody, though, because this is the whole, like, we've, uh, yeah. we're, show, we're, we're yeah. showing everybody no, that. We're good. We're good. Talak, no, it's Talak, all good. It's all Talak good. Talak saw this. Talak saw this one. I got to put a check mark there. This showed up on my Facebook page, Mitchell. <laughs> this okay. picture, I'm like, what? How did you get that's on my not page? me? I know. Oh, that's funny. I was like, Mitchell, what are you doing with that? This showed up on my Facebook page. This one. <laughs> that's funny. John Wallace. I think I showed this to you, John. I think. That one's pretty close. Bill? Uh, oh, I'll take William Shatner any day. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he looks like me, but I'll take it. JJ likes this one. And Jason approved that one. <laughs> That's it. It's good. It's good. Looks like looks like it'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay. As long as yeah, as long as people approve, I'm I'm 100 behind it. Um, yeah. Uh, next question. All right, Michael Smith from Silverado, uh, California. Do we need to contact Guinness just, World sorry, Records? For some reason, just before we do that, I just when we're talking about people who look like someone, um, 
the, the, for some reason, I just thought of this while we were, were looking through those. It's, I don't know if you've ever seen the thing where someone on Twitter said, I really wish I could find a guy like this. And it was Axl Rose. And then, and then Axl Rose responds and goes, hey. And, and the person says, no, not you. And he's like, I'm literally the guy. In the <laughs> Like, I'm literally the guy in that photo. <laughs> anyway, it was just a funny thing. <laughs> All right. When you think about um, doppelgangers. Anyway, let's go to the next one. All right. Uh, once again, Michael Smith from Silverado, California. Do we need to contact Guinness World Records? Someone should. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we can find some way to define it. Guinness, the, the game of Guinness Book is is all defining exactly what you are, you know, what... Uh, but but I, I might even have some context there. Let me, let me see if I can f f find one. I mean, it'd be interesting to see if, we, I think if we carefully define it, we could probably get in there. Be fun. Um, next question. Josh Kaufman from Pittsburgh, PA, asked, what humorous clips would be good to include for our Kilo show? Go ahead, Mitchell. I'm thinking a montage of uh, famous things, like um, um, You're Muted would be one of them. Uh, we could do a montage of that. Uh, perhaps uh, Alex saying never, ever, ever. Um, that would be interesting to see how many times that might have popped up. Any kind of red flagging would be fun. Um, let's let's go for it. <laughs> go ahead, Josh. So you know things that happened over and over again, but you know we're we're a tech community, so things whenever the tech doesn't quite work out, or you know uh, different um, different happenstance uh, things that have happened on the show, I think would be helpful for some of the humorous elements. Next question. Douglas Carmichael, could we have live interpretation for the 1,000th show similar to what Zoom did for Zoomtopia? If not, could we have machine-translated captions? All right, go ahead, Dave. I'm not too familiar with machine captioning, so I don't know how reliable yeah. it is and how fun it is to operate and whether our system plugs in easily. But... I guess the consideration is if there was some way Douglas could tell us where we could find this process, then we would apply it. Well, um, it, I, and it's also a show that's got no time limit, almost uh, three hours, four hours, whatever we decide to do. Yeah, uh, having it might might actually be a cost. So. Yeah, it's a lot of cost. I I know a lot about how to do both of those things, and um, we will be moving towards providing a variety of different accessibility features in two thousand in twenty twenty three. Uh, we will not do it on the our thousandth show because uh, I can tell you, as someone who works on captions, captions become captions and 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 um, and translate and interpretation oftentimes become eighty percent of the show really quickly. <laughs> like they just become there. They are a technical um, briar patch, and we want to unwrap that technical briar patch and start doing it regularly on a day to day basis so that we get good at it and so that all of us know how to do captioning, how to do um, you know. Um, uh, a variety of different interpretations, how to do um, script, audio description. All those things are things that we're interested in and we are going to work on. Um, that's really a 3.0 problem for me. So we're finishing 2.5, um, getting the quality up to where we want it is 2.5, but 3.0, I definitely want to add, start adding accessibility um, you know, stuff into, into what we're doing so that we know how to do it. And the goal is, in a lot of ways, what we do in production is really designed around it's not just that we want to do it for the show. We want to all learn how to do it and, and, and learn in a way that it's like, it's kind of obvious, you know, like, oh, oh yeah, we know how to do that. Like one of the things I think is really an advantage. Like I think that being on the show every morning with everybody makes me much better in meetings because I have this huge, you know, I've got a bunch of monitors all here. And because I use it every day, I'm very comfortable with using it. So in a meeting, I'm sitting there jumping between sources and I'm drawing on things and I'm making it all, I, it would be very uncomfortable and weird if I only did that once a week you know, or twice a week. But because I do it every day, it's a much more straightforward thing to do. And so um, so in the same way, we want to be able to get to that with captions and everything else. But it's, it, is, uh, it would probably make the show really cumbersome really fast if we try to do it uh, as a one-off. But as we do it as a pattern, so you can expect us to see it, do a lot more with that over, over time. Now, next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, PA, asked, what items could we include on the topic of origin stories? How did this begin? Go ahead, Josh. So um, a lot of people that haven't been here since the beginning, they see things that we kind of take for granted, and they wonder, well, how did, how did that begin? When do we start doing those things? So, for example, you know, we have our, our line of Fenwick products, the frame and the 
uh, lower Fenwick, you know, the Fenwick, the, we, we have Fenwick store. <laughs> I think there's more, I think he has some more, but you know, things that, um, we just take for granted, but others that have come later wonder about, um, you know, who came up with the Belfast method, you know, who started cooking first, you know, whose idea was that, yeah. um, you know, w- when did we start the, the mic checks and what was in, involved with that? Um, were there other forms of the show that we've since uh, discontinued or other other modes of the show? You know, how did it, you know, origin stories or how did it begin? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Maybe not origin, but how about uh, candidates for T-shirts for office hours with very specific uh, catchphrases that we like mm-hmm. here very much on office hours? Sure, maybe. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I think that it would be really interesting. I just thought of it when, when Josh was talking about how advanced our mag, mic checks have become compared to when we first started. And I think, I don't remember who, I think was it Grant that suggested that maybe we want to check everybody's mic before we get started. I don't remember who it was, you know, and it was, you know, it, it I think that there are some great, I, I, and it's probably just one segment of all the things that evolved, you know, like what where we started, where it, it was really starting right at, seven and then kind of seven and then and somehow i realized that people needed more time to get ready so we started at 6 30 or 6 40 and then 6 30 and then 6 15 then 6 and and then we started doing things 24 you know then we started and we added after hours and there's so many things about it i think talking through that progression would be really useful for folks to get caught up and, and have it it's not just that people can get caught up it's a record you know people can see it um yeah go ahead dave well, even the appearance of after hours is a long discussion and yeah. how it's benefited people. Uh, it certainly was the place where I came in and said, okay, you guys tell me what I need to improve in right. order to be able to be a panelist or to be able to participate technically. So yeah. I, I think that that would be a very interesting thing is for people's personal experiences to be testified to, I guess, uh, or for people to mark out where things happen in after hours. We don't record after hours, so we won't be able to use clips. But right. in the discussions and the panel discussions, there can be a lot of uh, testimonies of things that, you know, people had experiences with that after hours help them get a job or after hours help them uh, appear on a, a news show or something because they had good video. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Josh. And, you know, just because office hours has just snowballed and grown, I wonder if there were um, if there were any things that that we're doing now that we said we've never we'd never do, you know that we, <laughs> or we've we've accomplished or <laughs> or you know if there, maybe there, or maybe it was uh, you know with some a, a place of reason like yeah surely we'd never do that or maybe a naysayer or you know having that clip would be would be nice to have yeah yeah Bill I don't know if it may be too much work but I'd love to see some results of ruthless reviews that people always enjoy watching them and to see somebody who got a ruthless review and realized that they could improve and then did so based on that. You know, some time lapses, I don't know, this would probably be hard, but time lapses of some of our pan- regular panelists would be fun from version one to version two. Uh, you'd see my face get much wider. I was looking at some of the older ones. I was like, my face was so much <laughs> longer <laughs> before, so, before COVID. <laughs> Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I mean, we need people's help to to contribute those. Um, mm-hmm. It's a lot easier for you to give your evolution, your office hours evolution, than us trying to track that down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, what would you think of adding this behind-the-scenes clip from OH Space? Go ahead, Dave. We're in favor of any already prepared material, so if you know where they are, that's great. We, uh, of course, with some of our uh, convention coverage and that sort of stuff, shot quite a bit of behind-the-scenes stuff, uh, which never made it to air. So we're going to be looking through those little piles of things to see if there's some good backs. Uh, There's even a suggestion that Guy Cochran should recreate his run through again so that we can put good music to it you know that sort of thing anyway so yeah there are some behind the scenes things that that have been recorded and some people may have to scrounge their bottom drawer and see if they've got clips that we haven't seen yet that were shot at the time i know that uh, a couple of people at ibc had a lot of cell phone camera coverage that later was put into the pile so we're going to we're going to look where we know and that we don't know about we're looking for people to point it 
in our yeah. direction. Good, Mitchell. Dave, I have that clip of Guy running, putting his hand through his hair, and it is done <laughs> to music. There you go. Uh, next question. Harshid Trivedi from Daytona Beach, Florida, here on our panel. Can someone remind the community of our mission statement, please? A global conversation where no one's left out. Next question. A question, Douglas Carmichael. As the person who coined the term Belfast Method and Mobley Process, what about discussing how those came about as part of the show? Yeah, I think it'd be fun. Yeah, I think I think talking about how we came up with those and why we came up with them, and and uh, I think that that'd be a good good discussion point. That's great. So that's the update. Um, that is our update of the uh, you know for the Kilo show. Uh, we're very excited about it. We're excited to see um, where it goes. Uh, I think it's going to be a really fun day. I know I'm taking the day off, <laughs> so so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, uh, hang out with all of you, and and we're gonna see uh, what we what we come up with. Um, so if you've got ideas, uh, go ahead and keep on talking to Josh and Dave, and and uh, are, are you know are ta- working with the content and kind of giving people guidance on those things. So definitely reach out to them, um, and. Uh, and I think that, uh, I do think we want to segment, you know, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, a lot of bits. We'll, we'll give you another update probably. I don't know when, maybe the ninth or, or something like that when we start cutting things off, maybe two weeks out, between, halfway between here and there. I think maybe we'll, we'll do one more, uh, one more update to just tell everyone where we're at um, to make that actually happen. Um, and uh, yeah, so it should be fun. All right. Um, thanks so much to the panelists, or not, or the, or the, or the producers for asking all the questions and keep it going. We 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 just raged through that first hour, <laughs> like it was quite a thing. That was we covered a lot of ground. So really, uh, I thought I felt like the the velocity was really good. Um, so uh, so really well done uh, for uh, you know from from both uh, the producers' perspective as well as the as the panelists. Uh, and of course, thank you, thank you to the panelists. Nice big uh, Friday, uh, Thanksgiving here in the U.S. Uh, it was really good to see all of you here. Um, thanks for your contribution. I can't do this without you. And uh, also thanks to the back end team. Um, rain or shine or uh, holidays or Sundays, <laughs> nothing stops them. So uh, so the uh, so anyway, so thank, thanks to the incredible crew on the back end that makes all of this happen. All right, let's go ahead and uh, jump into After Hours. Remember that <laughs> Tom, remember it's Black Friday, be kind to your credit cards. Tom's, Tom's going to talk about kids. In, in oh, I got a whisper. <laughs> oh, I got a whisper. Even, even Mitch's dog doesn't whisper. He's like so against whispering. Woof. No, it's Wolf. Wolf, yeah. So you can hear you whisper to Wolf. That's why you have a t-shirt. Your, your dog is Wolf. Go back to... I made a big diffuser today. Yesterday. It's not big enough. It's not. But it's just an empty rail. Cutter. It's not that hard. Turkey wrappers. <laughs> 